podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Hey, yo, it's the TMBA pod. Welcome back. Here you are, boss man. Name just keeps getting shorter, doesn't it? Yeah. When are you going to just say like T-Pod? It's the modern age, man. No attention span. You got to squeeze it in. (laughs) Here's what we're going to talk about today. One of my favorite topics. I love talking about business ideas. You were always the business idea guy between the two of us. I leached. I grabbed your coattails so hard. Come on. Because... Everything you saw, it was always a business idea, and I didn't know how you came up with this stuff. You just didn't realize what a corner I was in. I felt like I was like, my feet were off the ground. I was so far into the corner. (laughs) It's like my back was against the wall, man. I had no choice. But here's the thing, Ian. Over the years, as we've done business for you know over a decade now, I've learned how to generate business ideas. In fact, it's it's sort of a muscle you can exercise and. Today, we're going to talk about how listeners can exercise that muscle themselves. So if you're having trouble coming up with a business idea or coming up with a good one, we are going to talk a little bit about that today. And then later on in the episode, we are going to revisit some predictions we made, some business ideas that we sort of thought were going to be big back in 2015. And we're going to see about how things have changed over the last three years. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, let's roll it. Yeah, at the beginning, I thought this episode was just going to be about business ideas, like actually talking about the ideas themselves. But I I started to go down a, a little bit of a rabbit hole thinking, how do you come up with a business idea in the first place? Like, what is the approach one can take to construct these things? So what we've done here is we've pulled together five ways, a list of ways you can come up with a business idea. This is not an exhaustive list, of course. I'm not even sure if all these ways are correct, Ian. They might not be. I'll put it out there. But there's ways in which you can think about this to start to generate, do some brainstorming on your own, and we'd love to hear your ideas if you have any. So the first way you can come up with a business idea is you can put yourself in an old Western town. Essentially, this is the issue, Dan. The internet has made it like very confusing, even for people like me that hang out on the internet all day, as to what is important in terms of starting a business. So there's like 100 blogs, there's 100 books written about like how to start a business, why you need to start a business, structurally, what are the things that are, need to be in place for it to be successful, yada, yada, yada. And I just thought, like, let's boil this down, Dan, to simpler times times where I could understand what was actually going on, because the internet has made things very complicated for me. So here it is. You are a new settler in the West. So you've come with your camp, your carts, your buggies, your horses. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, got it. And you're settling, and you're setting up shop. So first thing you build is the courthouse. Town hall. You build the town hall, right. Tavern. You might build the tavern. And so you got a couple structures, you got a bunch of people sitting around, and you're thinking like, hmm, all right, our basic needs are met. What's next? Oh, turns out we need a blacksmith. Okay. So somebody decides, hey, I'm Ian, I'm going to be the town blacksmith. And then someone decides like, well, where's the general store? How are we going to get our feed for our horses? How are we going to get our clothes? Dan, you raise your hand and you say, I'm going to start the general store. Before you know it, you got a town, it's bustling, and then at some point, Somebody new comes into town, Dan. Somebody that hasn't been in this town before, that doesn't know what's going on. An outsider. Yeah, they're an outsider. They set up a blacksmith shop right next to my blacksmith shop. They don't even give it two thoughts. What do you think is going to happen to that guy? Everybody knows me. Everybody's been coming to me for years. No innovation going on at new blacksmith guy. He's doing the same thing I'm doing. Maybe it's even less quality. That guy's going out of business. (laughs) Came into town didn't understand what was going on, set up shop, not going to work out. So I'll just say like all these simple ideas, Dan, about like this town and like the way that it operates, it works the same way on the internet. I think the internet's just gotten confusing for a lot of people. 
Yeah, I mean, I, the way I think about this is I got an email from a listener a few weeks back, wanted to show me the store that they had created online, and it was for, let's just say, CrossFitters. And the whole conversation revolved around like my advertising, my keyword. It was like tactic after tactic after tactic. But there was no mention of like the CrossFitters themselves or that community and what they needed. It's really easy on the web to say, oh, well, I'm just going to do some like research and I string enough tactics together and all of a sudden I'm going to have a business. What you're essentially saying is, that, hey, it's a lot easier to simplify and just ask yourself, if you're going to sell things to a community, what are the things that they really need? And how am I going to understand what those things are? So the guy that came into town and he set up a blacksmith shop right next to mine, what he could have done is he could have hung out in town for a couple months, realized that there was a need for a butcher because we don't have a butcher yet in town, and opened up a butcher shop. We're talking about the frontier here, boss man. Now, we're on a frontier town. We might be doing some old things like blacksmithing, but we're doing it on the frontier. And that's where business opportunities exist as well. We can stretch this metaphor for the entire episode. Let's go to number two way you can think about generating a business idea, which is to watch their feet, not their mouths. A concept we talk a lot about. How can you do this? One way you can do it is not by hanging out on blogs and podcasts that try to address this issue head on. The reason is, number one, those entrepreneurs aren't necessarily representative of the entrepreneurs that are making money in the real world. So, you know, when I think about our community, Ian, me and you, we're the weirdos, right? Like there's hundreds, thousands of people making legitimate incomes off of legitimate businesses that aren't sitting around philosophizing about how to have business ideas. The second reason is if you're going to gather where people are trying to solve that problem, so you have like a few people who quote like understand how to have good ideas and then a bunch of people seeking the answers, this is essentially an oasis for people who don't know what they're doing. Because all the people that are good at having business ideas, all the people that are excellent at having profitable ideas, they're off doing it. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, you want to get swindled, like that's the place to hang out. <laughs> right. So where can you see feet if you don't want to see mouths? Well, you can see them in advertising campaigns is one example. Follow the money trails. Where is the actual cash? And this is a very interesting mindset to get yourself into. For example, like you see an ad on Facebook or you see an ad on Google and it's for a product and you see a lot of those ads. Well, those products are probably generating a fair amount of income if people can afford to spend money on those ads. So again, think about the products that you're seeing advertised, not necessarily the products that people are saying that you should sell. All right. The third way to come up with a business idea is to not worry so much about doing something new. Instead, do something old for someone new. We've talked about this for like years. This is something that we figured out like in the very beginning, which is like, you don't have to be doing anything new. You just have to be doing something innovative. You have to change something that's already working. I think the words like innovation and new are really intimidating. If anybody is listening to this and is like, I have a really hard time coming up with good business ideas. I relate to you because it's intimidating to be innovative. For me, it's a lot easier to say, and those things are true, like innovative ideas are good, new ideas are good, but it can be a little bit easier to say, you know, what if I just did something that's already working, but I did it for like a new type of company that's emerging? So for example, you could say, well, like these sorts of marketing campaigns work really well for like this industry. What if I just took those campaigns and delivered them to this new emergent industry that's only been around for you know five years and they don't have the same level of service? We've talked about this years ago. We called it Rip Pivot Jam, where the rip is essentially you're looking for something that's already working. And so that's looking for feet, not mouths. These people are already making money doing this. I'm going to pivot it into something new and I'm going to jam on it. You hear about examples of this all the time on the show where you say like, hey, well, every business needs accounting services. But now there's these new businesses that are multiplying in the thousands every year that they're location independent. The way that they need accounting services is going to be different than the way that an established traditional business would. You know, getting to this point where like you're like sitting down 
and you like can't think of a business idea. You're... Every day you're solving a bunch of problems, but you're not thinking about how to turn those into a business. So that's the first thing. It's like, what problems am I solving, right? Next thing is like, okay, is anybody making money solving these problems? Because a lot of times, like, it's just not even worth it. So it's like, how much does it hurt? Is there a big pain there? I think if you can find a problem that causes enough pain for people, then it's a big enough problem, then there's going to be money at the end of that. So I think it's just a matter of like reframing the way that you're sitting in your chair. Well, yeah, in that sense, like being an entrepreneur can be as simple as flipping the switch because, hey, if you have a job and someone's paying you thousands of dollars a month to do it, well, you've already cracked the code in some way, right? You've figured out something that's valuable. And how many people do you know, like walk away from that job? They've already cracked the code of making thousands of dollars a month. And then they go try to do some weird tactic they read about from a blowhard on the internet. You know, it's like, wait a second, you are solving problems all day long. I mean, in our case, it was when we started a manufacturing business, something that we were doing eight hours a day anyway. That was the first successful business we had, not the SaaS software application that I dreamed up at a coffee shop on the weekend. You know, a lot of times these problems that you think you're solving, you're solving in a vacuum. The reason why the manufacturing thing for us was so ready at hand is because we were already doing it. And again, we we're in the thick of it. We understood the pain. It was a big one. And we figured out how to solve it for people. A lot of times, people, I don't think, Dan, can be honest with themselves about what the actual pain is and if it's worth money. And again, this is like, watch their feet, not their mouths. Are people actively already solving those types of problems? How are you uniquely suited to solve them for them? And one of the ways you can use this, like say, rip pivot idea is, well, what you could rip is your core skill set at your job, if you have one, or consultancy. And then the pivot is repositioning that skill set for to deliver at scale in a productized way, in a way that could address a new market or a bigger market than your employer. Can we talk about this town again real quick here? Why don't we name it while we're at it? I got it. So we'll call it Shonesville. Shonesville. In Shonesville, the guy that moved in next to me, blacksmith, don't really like him because he's doing the same thing I am. Let's just say he comes into town with a little thing called WD-40. And I had never seen WD-40 before. <laughs> and the customers that are going to him, their guns are sliding real nice. They're all lubed up. And my guns, they're kind of rusty. They're hard to pull back. That's innovation. That guy figured something out that I don't know about. And therefore, he's going to get more customers. He's going to get more business. Maybe I'm the one that's going to go out of business. Innovation normally happens while you're in the thick of it. You had to be a blacksmith to see the value of adding the WD-40, in other words. It wasn't someone sitting on the sidelines figuring out. Exactly. The point is well taken. And thanks for bringing up the town again. Today's episode is sponsored by the Bean Ninjas. Do you have a constant feeling of anxiety about the mess that your accounts are in? Tax deadlines are something that we all truly dread. And what's worse, most bookkeeping professionals think that an Amazon product is just rainforest lumber. If you identify with any of this, we have good news for you. Bean Ninjas is a bookkeeping and financial reporting service designed to take those problems away. And they specialize specifically in online businesses, so they get what we do. From day one, let the Bean Ninjas keep your books clean and in order, and they do it all online, so you can focus on growing your business. And for listeners of the TMBA podcast, Bean Ninjas is offering a one-hour road mapping session to help clarify where your finances are at and what your next step should be for only $100. It's a third of their usual price. So go check them out over at BeanNinjas.com and let them know the TMBA sent you. And a big thanks to the team at Bean Ninjas for sponsoring the pod. The number four approach that you can think about developing a business idea is, this is a long one, stick with me. If older business people know enough about it to think it's a joke, it's probably not a joke. Okay, so this might not apply to everyone, but I can remember a time when pretty much everything that is generating multi-millions in profit, like the businesses that everyone's talking about, I can remember a time when either I or somebody very close to me thought it was a complete joke. And there's a sort of sweet spot between whatever new technology or new approach to business or whatever, it has enough recognition that people 
know about it, but it's weird enough that people discount it. I'll say the one that I thought was a joke at first is Instagram. I pick up this app and I'm like looking at all this stuff and I'm like, this is kind of narcissistic. And then before I know it, people are making serious money on Instagram, marketing their products. You got to be careful about you know, sort of getting stuck in your tastes or stuck in the way you think things ought to happen. I think one of the reasons you, we tend to think this way is, you know, you're committed to the way you do things. And so now all of a sudden you're going to get undermined by some freaking picture site. Here's something crazy. This just happened like two days ago. I was on Instagram looking for a manufacturer of a part that I need. That seems so crazy to me, right? Like, in the past, I would like go to Google and I would like go to Alibaba and I would like search for a manufacturer. But like now I'm on Instagram looking for a product manufacturer. I remember a time when I personally thought that Airbnb was an uncomfortable idea. I remember conversations where people told me that selling virtual products was an idiotic idea. I remember a time when people wrote off things like Snapchat. And certainly now we're in this climate where people there's a lot of people that really want to think that cryptocurrencies are not going to be a thing. Well, sorry, they're a thing. They're a big thing. It's this idea of if people are sort of looking down their noses at it and say, oh, that's for the kids. It's dumb. It, I don't understand it or whatever. There could be a really big opportunity there. Okay. So let's talk about number five then. Number five is deconstruct the micro multinational hyper-internationalized, small businesses, location-independent, what we talk about on this show, sometimes we call it the micro-multinational, and sell it back to them. This is sort of one that I've been thinking about. We talk about productized services a lot on the show. I think we're in this age, Ian, where the elements that make a profitable business are continuing to become more and more productized and... Decentralized, I'd say, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Decentralized. And also, like they're becoming legible units. Whereas in the past, you had this amalgam of sort of like office plus salaries plus employees plus sort of all these processes executing profitable actions. Now you can go buy a campaign, for example. You don't have to buy like an advertising firm or whatever. You can just buy the campaign off the shelf. Yeah, there's all these like little business nodes now. So like, you know, we used to think about our business, like you said, Dan, in like this physical space with these people with this like telephone line coming in, this internet line going out. And now that's like not the way it is at all. So you can purchase your products from one supplier. You can purchase your advertising from another supplier. You can purchase your bookkeeping from another supplier. And these aren't necessarily people that are like integrated into your company full time. These are people that you contract with. I think that you can even see this like breaking down even further on like an advertising level, right? So like your advertiser is purchasing advertising from another firm. There's always been professional services and stuff. That's true. But now you can actually sort of purchase results or elements of advertising. So for example, you can purchase likes on Facebook, or you can purchase views on YouTube. You could, in theory, purchase a Facebook advertising campaign. Those are the sorts of things that, you know, five years ago, you might get a consult marketing consultant. 10 years ago, you might have a marketing person. Well, now you just might buy the campaign itself. That's a business opportunity for listeners of the show to create those products because people are just waiting for them. To recap, five ways to come up with a business idea. Put yourself in an old Western town, number one. Number two, watch their feet, not their mouths. Number three, don't worry about doing something new. Do something old for someone new. Number four, if people are making fun of it, it might be not worth making fun of. And number five, deconstruct the micro multinational and sell it back to them. That's sort of an interesting way to like look at that fifth one there, Ian. It's sort of an interesting way to take the principle of watching feet, not mouths. Because if it already exists in a profitable business, then it's profitable, right? So all you're doing is you're essentially yanking it out of the busy, messy, unprofitable structure of a traditional business and you're selling it back to them as an efficient, clean product. I'd say like a virtual CFO is a great example of that. And I've seen that. I kind of predicted this, I think like five or six years ago, Dan, this idea that like smaller companies were going to have shared CFOs. And I'm seeing that start to happen. There's a part of your business that needs attention, right? It's like the financial organization of your company. 
traditionally speaking, like this person was very expensive and you had to get to like a certain level in your business, millions of dollars where you could actually afford to have this person. Otherwise, it was like the founder doing this kind of work. And now it's like it's a product as service. People for a couple thousand dollars a month can hire a virtual CFO to do the kinds of work that they had to pay traditionally thousands of dollars to. So let's take a look back at some of those ideas from episode 278, which originally aired in 2015. So Dan, to deliver this business idea, I need a little bit of inspiration here. So I got a little bit of background music. I don't know if you guys were around in 1993, but this is one of my favorites. Cypress Hill. Peter Thiel wrote Zero to One, just announced the other day that I think he's pledging a bunch of money to marijuana. For those of you that haven't been paying attention to the news, don't live in Colorado, don't care. Marijuana is going to be a major multi-billion dollar industry in the future. Um, I personally know people that are involved in this industry. I think that there's a lot of regulation that's going to happen. There's a lot of money to be had. I think there's a lot of corporations that are going to be getting in on it. So, you know, I don't really know the angle from selling the weed. But what I do know is that there's going to be a lot of accessories that are related to the weed that are going to be a lot less regulated. And I can already see that with these companies that are making vaporizers because vaporizers are very in fashion right now. They're in fashion with the tobacco community and they're certainly in fashion with the marijuana community. So I think that if you haven't already started to think about if you're a product designer, you're a product guy or an engineer or something like that, if you haven't started to think about making a vaporizer, it might be the time. Boss man, I got to say, you have a really good track record for calling stuff. I can recall multiple occasions where you have predicted the future. What is your secret? By the way, how much money have we made off of the marijuana market? You know what I mean? All the profits have been smoked, bro. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's real easy to like predict things. It's really hard to do anything about it, though. It's easy to be an armchair quarterback. It's hard to get in the game. Totally. And that's not the way you really have business ideas, right? It's easy to say, oh, such and such is going to be huge. But if you're not willing to go join the game, you're not going to be in a position to really capitalize on it. Right. We are always tossing around like the industries that you missed or, oh, I saw it coming, but I didn't mention anything. I think non-alcoholic beer is going to be a big thing in America within the next 10 years. 100% agree. There's so many reasons for it that are obvious, but like one is it's stigmatized in the US right now. But I've noticed living here in Europe that there's no such stigma and that it's really popular. Like it's always an option at restaurants. It's always an option at the convenience store. It's clear that people are buying this stuff because it's not like, you know, in the US you have like one little row of like, the non-alcoholic beer. Here it's like it's a meaningful portion of the actual refrigerator. And these companies are sponsoring sports teams. A lot of athletes drink non-alcoholic beer because they want to hydrate themselves with something that's not sweet. You want to go out to dinner and you want to drink something that has a little bit more sophisticated of a taste than just water. And it's healthy. You don't necessarily want to be drinking alcohol all the time. And I hate to see all these studies that are coming down that are destroying my perception that alcohol is a health food. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was just saying, you heard it here first on this podcast. (laughs) Non-alcoholic beer is healthy. (laughs) I enjoyed very much drinking a fair amount of non-alcoholic beer when I was with you in Spain cycling. It is like my favorite drink to have after a long bike ride. You have two or three of those guys, and you feel great. At lunch, you want to have an adult beverage, but you don't want to get buzzed because you got things to do the rest of the day. Non-alcoholic beer. Yep. The reason I think it hasn't caught on yet in the United States, honestly, Dan, this might sound a little bit weird, but there's like a little bit too much like bro machoism going on. There's like a little bit too much like teasing of like friends and things like that. It's stigmatized. There's no other way to say it. I mean, in the United States, for those that don't live there, drinking a non-alcoholic beer is equivalent to admitting alcoholism. Exactly. And it's weird. So what I have to say about that is bros grow up. All right, let's move on to the next clip, Ian. I think there's a lot of opportunity in e-currencies. I honestly think, you know, like we used to have the episodes about blogging as a dead on arrival, you know. I don't think you could go wrong if you started a Bitcoin blog. Maybe I wouldn't call it Bitcoin. You know, I'd call it something branded that doesn't have to do with that particular e-currency. But I don't see any way that these things aren't huge deals. And if you're into, you know, building an audience, maybe making a podcast or starting a blog, I just don't see how you could run out of inspiration 
and interesting things to talk about and ways to educate people. You know, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around what's going on with all these digital currencies. And I'd love to subscribe to more blogs that explain these opportunities to me and show me how to take it to the next level. Yeah, Ian, like you said in the previous example, not too tough of a call. I wasn't really putting my neck on the line to say that cryptocurrencies were going to be a thing. But if you want to see a beautiful way of, of how this sort of thing can get executed, check out what Clay Collins is doing over at nomics.com. And it's just so cool. You can instantly see by what he started with writing about the scene, covering it, you know, taking a journalistic approach, creating podcasts. Now, all of a sudden, there's things you can buy from them. Of course, you know, we're talking about information for businesses. And it's not hard to imagine a broad range of products and services that you can provide simply by writing about things that are valuable. Speaking of things that are valuable, Dan, you ever uh, watch Miss Cleo? You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> In the United States, there was this, I'd say like Oracle. And she was on television and she had a 1-800 number and you would call and Miss Cleo would like tell you about the future, your future specifically. Like a palm reader. Pretty much. Crystal ball, palm reader, things like that. What do you think about doing this for a business? I think it's a great idea. It's a rip. You take Miss Cleo for emerging internet entrepreneurs. Yes. I think it's a great idea. In fact, I think you'd be great at it. I'm surprised no <laughs> one else has done this before. <laughs> Let's move on to the next clip. Simon Arthur from Atlanta, Georgia. Go Hawks. Do you follow the NBA? Is that just me? Just me? Just you. <laughs> says, how about a $10 a month accurate analytics through the server side plugin? I agree that would be something that people would be interested. Or $50 for one-step creator for a graphical banner ads of various sizes and formats. I think this is a big pain point, actually, is advertisement banners. If you could like fill out like a type form or a Google form, the types of ad campaigns that you want to be run, and you could just have an experienced designer pump out your ad campaign for you, I think that that's a winner. I also think that you know the server-side analytics thing is interesting for podcasters. It's really difficult to figure out how many people download your show, actually. It's an absolute disaster. I mean, I can't believe how little progress we've seen on that front. Ian, podcasting has changed a lot in the last three years. I mean, it's still this sort of relatively new industry and it's becoming even more powerful. Seth Godin earlier this year said he was going to stop writing books essentially to podcasts because that's what his audience wanted. And it's just, it's engaging this whole new demographic that previously didn't read books that often, but now all of a sudden wants audio content through the form of audiobooks and podcasts. I was reading an article the other day. I mentioned it on the pod last week. Now, all of a sudden, you've got this enormous demographic of people sort of getting switched on to the power of audio content, and brands are taking notice. A lot of audio learners out there, Dan. I don't know if you took that test when you were a kid. I am an audio learner. What you said at the beginning here is true, I think, which is an industry is building around podcasting. So in the beginning, it was like a muse. It was like people did it because they loved it, because it was interesting, and now it's becoming a business. And we're starting to see that happen. We're starting to see all these products and services crop up around podcasting. This could have been predicted, right? We did predict it, kind of. Check out Backtracks. It's a company that is sort of a hosting plus analytics software for podcasting. There's all kinds of agencies popping up around this sort of thing now. Basically, companies that are building portfolios of small, medium-sized shows and then going out and selling that block to large advertisers like national advertisers. So people are getting switched on to it. It's a thing. There's all sorts of people that want to make money from podcasting and are making a lot of money from podcasting. So it certainly is interesting. And this is, again, it's like you do something old for someone new, right? Like advertising, selling ads, creating quality content, like... None of that's new. But now all of a sudden, podcasting is. Right. The medium is new. Exactly. So there you go. And by the way, I mean, all you got to do is go on your telephone, and now all of a sudden, there's content coming through Instagram in the form of video. You know, I said the medium is new, but it's not even that the medium is new. Like, spoken content is old, right? Radio is old. It's the channel. It is the channel. The delivery of the medium is new. The fundamental idea of this episode is business ideas. Most businesses start with that channel. It's seeing the channel that is the actual inroad into having the business. 
And so how are you going to acquire customers? And if you're saying like, well, I'm going to do something old, but I'm going to acquire my customers via Instagram because like all the real estate on Main Street is taken. So I can't set up my hair studio there. All the hair studio in my town on Google is taken up, but there's no one doing Instagram well. So now all of a sudden I'm going to have a hair studio, but I'm going to do it on Instagram. So that's another way you can think about this stuff. Let's move on to the next clip here, Ian. How about post-credentialized staffing? There's a lot of ideas around training people for the new economy. What if you could pay a company to train you up as an SEO expert, seomasters.com or whatever, and on the back end, you were plugging these SEO experts into companies like ours. So in other words, we don't have to train people on our process. We can buy the process from a school, which is essentially what you know you used to do from the Ivy Leagues or from top engineering colleges, right? We'll call it Flagstaff University, right across from Phoenix. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> that works for me. I like this. You know, we also talked about the notion of creating your own credentials, like what Patty did in the diving industry. You know, they codified what it means to become a diver, thus, you know, making diving a little bit safer, but really what they did is they created more income for dive shops. Ian, the trend is clear here. The classic corporation that drove a lot of our traditions, like credentialized societies and universities and the sort of career arc even, it's disintegrating. Like the middle is being ripped out of these corporations because you can simply go direct thanks to the internet. You know, all these internet tools and technologies have essentially gutted a lot of what traditional corporations needed to have on staff. And the reality is, is that companies need less employees. So what's going to happen is there's going to be more companies with less employees. That just seems to be true. I mean, eventually we're all going to be in a situation where we're all just our own little profit pod. We won't even need to be in teams anymore. We were there for like sort of like the virtual assistant explosion. Then Upwork came along. There's businesses taking advantage of this. There's one that you could take a look at called Free Up, which is pretty interesting. Essentially, they're providing a service, which I think is a big opportunity for listeners, where they're providing trained freelancers to sort of come into your business, do something specific. That's an enormous opportunity, right? Like, sort of like taking the personality out of it just a little bit. Like, you're not bringing someone on your team so much as you're bringing the skill set into your company that you need to get executed or, you know, you're buying a process in. Pretty fascinating. It is pretty fascinating, Dan. I think that these companies are are needing less full time employees. And a lot of that has to do with like software and a lot of that has to do with like these nodes that you described that you can outsource different processes. I do think a lot though, Dan, about like is it just shifting or are we needing less? I think what's probably happening is it's like shifting. So like more people are becoming freelancers, more people are becoming specialized. It's not that we're needing less people. It's that we're needing less people in our actual physical office. Some of it's getting eroded by software, but like the same amount of work actually needs to be done. It's like the question of technology. Does it save you from work or does it just give you more work to do? You know, it's like, does your dishwasher save you time? Does it really? Because I've always hated dishwashers. I've never had a dishwasher where I didn't have to pre-wash the dishes. Here's the interesting thing about like a company like FreeUp. And I think this is sort of what we were gesturing towards in that earlier episode, which it seems like they're doing well, at least from their website here. You can go there and you can hire an Amazon specialist. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about. You know, like there was no such thing as an Amazon specialist five years ago. These are where the opportunities exist, I think. Building a, a business where you're training people on these specific, super valuable things that you can then introduce into small businesses. Lots of opportunities there. Also, it's worth mentioning we're involved in the hiring space as well. Really? Yeah. Well, I don't know if we've mentioned Dynamite Jobs, but just an enormous explosion of remote work opportunities. And they're not so much necessarily those flexible work from home jobs that existed 10 years ago, boss man. This is telecommuting. It's not quite telecommuting. It's something similar though, but it, these sorts of jobs, they have a culture to their own, you know? And it's sort of the culture that we're exploring here in the community on the podcast. It's pretty exciting to hook people up with jobs on a daily basis. Seems like that's more or less where we're heading. It is exciting, Dan. And it's one of the things that we talked about, obviously, several years ago. And it's uh, actually one of the things that we're not just armchair quarterbacking. We're going to do something about it. 
Well, Ian, we didn't quite get around this episode to sharing business ideas for the next three to five years, but let's put that on the schedule in the coming weeks. I think that would be a cool episode to do. We'd love to hear your ideas. Do you agree with us, disagree, how to come up with a business idea, or do you have a method that really works well for you? We'd love to hear from you. This one's going to be posted at tropicalmba.com slash business ideas redux. We will return next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for joining us. See you later, boss man. See you then. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.